enough about the Women's Center. More excited to have Pat here today. Um, Dr. Patricia Andre, I know her personally as well, yeah. so um, she's an awesome person and obviously very accomplished, so we want to hear you. Yeah, I'm, yes. Thank you. So um, <clears throat> thank you, Eva. You know, Eva and I have been friends, and <laughs> I'm friends with her brother and her dad and her parents. So um, when I heard she was the director, I was very, I'm very proud of her, and thought I could um, offer some <coughs> words of thoughts or thir thoughts. Um, so just a little bit about myself first. Um, I'm from New Bedford. I was born in St. Luke's Hospital. Uh, my dad was in the service. My parents were both from New Bedford as well. My grandparents all came from the Cape Verde Islands um, for different reasons, but they all came, you know, in the early 1900s. So we are, I, I am second generation American. And um, my dad was in the service and my mom um, was a, mostly a homemaker. She was a professional, she was an executive secretary at some part of her life too, but um, hmm? Domestic engineer. Domestic engineer, yeah. So, you know, and one of the things that I realized with from my parents were they were very smart, very, all my family, but my parents in particular, very smart people who just were born in a time when, when they couldn't um, advance, you know, for they were born in, you know, in the 30s and 40s or whatever. And at that time, there weren't that many opportunities. And so one of the things I think that they never really kind of pushed us, you know, that, but they, they always had a very strong presence um, of their own. And I think that's what my, me and my siblings, there are five of, there were f five of us all together, kind of learned in the home is that um, you're confident in whatever you do and you take pride in whatever you do, but you try and do the best that you possibly can. And, and I think my, I, my parents definitely did that. And so now that I'm older, as I think about what, what were the influences that made me do what I'm doing, there are multiple, there are multiple levels. It wasn't just my parents, it was my extended family. And I think a lot of my culture, the Cape Verdean culture is one in which it, it um, values education, it values bettering yourself and moving to a better place. And I think all of that um, makes up me and why I do what I do. So I went to New Bedford High School. We moved around a lot as a child, um, but by the time I was in high school, we were settled in New Bedford. So I went to New Bedford High School. And you know, I f you know one of the things that happened in New Bedford High School, um, you know, I realized that I had to make my way. I had to um, not not demand things, but because I was really shy in high school, really shy. But I knew what I wanted to do, and as those ideas formulated, you know, I wanted to be a a doctor since I was a young girl, actually. Um, and so I knew that in order to do that, I had to have certain things in place. And, and I think one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is, is choices and how you find yourselves in a predicament or in a situation and you have to choose, you really have to consciously choose what do you want from that or how do you want that situation to uh, affect you. It can affect, you can let it affect you negatively if it's a negative thing because a lot of us go through things that are not positive. I mean, and I can tell you, in high school, I knew I wanted to go to a good school. I knew I wanted to go to medical school. I knew if, if I wanted to go to medical school, I had to do well. Um, but I also had to line myself up with good education. And I remember being in the guidance office and looking at certain schools that were, <clears throat> that were prominent schools, and I remember the guidance counselor saying, oh, well, why don't you just look at, you know, I don't think it was SMU at the time, or SMU, or um, some other smaller school, and I'm like, but I'm a very good student. I'm an honor society. I, you know, I have all of these things, and why not shoot for the highest school I can? And I remember him just kind of blowing me off. 
off and not really saying, oh yeah, go for it. And that was probably the first time that, not the first time, but the first time as a almost adult that I started to realize that if I want to make my way, there are definitely going to be people who are going to help me, but I also have to help myself and I also have to say, all right, you know what? You're useless. <laughs> I'm not talking to you anymore. Leave me to my devices. And, and there have been multiple instances along my life, even recently, where I've had to do that. You're useless. I got no time for you. I got time for that. And if you're not going to help me positively, fine. And I don't have to be nasty about it. And I think, um, you know, one of the things you'll find, well, I don't know if you know very many women surgeons. I'm a general surgeon, by the way. Um, and I'll tell you all about that. But there are, aren't many, well, there are getting to be more. But there are not that many women surgeons. Uh, and I think a lot of women surgeons find that they need to be this nasty, you know, not easy to work with kind of person in order to get respect. And that's a choice. That's a choice that they made at some point in their lives. And I don't agree with that. I think, you know, I can be me. I can, if, if someone doesn't want to accept me as, a, as the, the surgeon or person I am, well, they'll figure it out eventually because <laughs> all I got to do is stay my course and I don't have to prove anything. I just be. And I think, you know, a lot of women kind of get um, twisted up in that, in that conundrum about how do you prove yourself to others when everybody's looking at all of the other factors against you, you know, and no one is going to give you, no one's giving you anything because you're a woman or no one's giving you anything because you're a person of color or no one's going to think about you in the same way that they're thinking about the guy next to you. So it's a choice. So there, there's, it's a choice of how do you handle those nuances of relationships and how do you, um, how do, so I've had to make constant choices about how do I internalize those things or how do I leave them be and say, okay, I know what I need to do. I know what I want. And so it's, it's, and it, and it, and it doesn't stop. It's part of life. I think it's part of growth is to, when you face a different situation, to say, OK, I didn't ask for this situation. It's not really what I want. But how can I make choices? How can I move this needle to where I really want it to be and not to where it's going? And even if it's going down, OK, but it's not going to be down forever if I keep keep banging at that hammer, be, keep banging at that nail. Um, so, I, so I went to high school. I, I went to Wellesley College, which is a very good women's college in Massachusetts. It's still all women. Um, and I grew there. I was, like I said, I was really shy um, when I got to college. And, um, it, and I'm not sure what happened, to be honest with you. I think I started to meet people and you start to learn and you start to understand that you can do things you can accomplish and um, and I loved Wellesley it was a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful school and a lot of support for women and because it's support for women and I think there that there is something about being in an all women's environment where especially when you're learning because women still like to sort of sit back and take a back seat. And, um, you know, I have a daughter who I've really worked very hard to say, no, you have to do your utmost and not don't relegate yourself to second class because everyone, a lot of people will do that anyway, but don't do it to yourself. And so I think that's what I got most from Wellesley because, you know, we're in, it, there were small classes. We had probably like nine, 10 people. And, and you were, you were encouraged to use your mind to think, to investigate, to question. And, and so I think during that process, um, I sort of figured, found out myself a bit and wasn't shy anymore. And, you know, I, I, I was 
I ran my dormitory, which was a big deal at school. And, you know, you learn to deal with people. You learn to figure out, you know, understand interpersonal issues. And I like that. I was a sociology major, actually, in college. Um, took all my pre-med requirements, but I was a sociology major and sort of wished I had minored in philosophy because I like that. But um, <clears throat> And then I went on to medical school. I did Dartmouth in New Hampshire, two years there, and it was a combined program, Dartmouth-Brown. So I went to Dartmouth Medical School and then finished at Brown and then did my surgical residency at Rhode Island Hospital in Providence. And all through that time, I'm, you know, it's hard to say, well, what did you learn? Because, you know, you're basically like this, trying to just get from one course to the next and make sure you memorize everything that you have to memorize. And, but, but I also, you know, realized that it's not, it's not just academics. You know, there's this other piece that you're learning about, not just yourselves, but you're learning about other people and you're learning how to deal with other people. And um, it's kind of strange that I ended up in surgery. Not strange exactly, because I, I tell people my mom sewed. She taught me to sew. I <laughs> used to sew clothes. Now I sew people. Um, but I had n was never in my radar screen. And I think it's because, you know, I never saw anybody who was a surgeon. You know, I knew pediatrician. That's what my yearbook in high school says. I'm going to be a pediatrician. Because I knew that's what doctors were, other than Marcus Welby. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but then when I got to residency in uh, medical school, you do a little of everything. You do. You spend time in psychiatry and gynecology and medicine and surgery and pediatrics and I didn't like pediatrics at all and I love surgery because it was there was always something to do you know I like the applicability of knowledge so you would learn something and then you would identify what's wrong with this person and then we took them to the operating room and you say okay we fixed it and I like that sort of immediacy of surgery and that gratification of surgery and you know whereas medicine you know somebody comes in with blood pressure you give them a blood pressure pill you have to wait a few months to see if it's working and you know, it's just a little bit too slow for me um and even in re and so in residency i was um i think i was probably the fourth woman to finish surgical residency at rhode island hospital certainly all the first woman of color that's no question this and the third person of color there were two men who had finished a couple years before me and, you know, as I link, think back of my life, I think, oh my, you know, there were a lot of, there are lots of instances where I've been the first and not intentionally. And it just is, is the time in which we live that we still unfortunately have people who are the first of things, you know, and I think, um, I mean, I'm very proud of that, it, but it just happened. It wasn't anything I strove you know, strove to do, I think that's a word, strove to do. Um, so it's, it's funny, but I know even in residency, which in, you know, surgery is a very male dominated world, which is kind of interesting that I went from this all women's college to a male dominated, a completely male dominated profession. But again, what I found was what, what was necessary for me to survive is to make those choices and to decide, okay, um, they may not want to talk to me right off the bat because I'm a girl, but eventually if I just sit long enough, they will. And like when I started at St. Luke's Hospital, which was 23 years ago, um, Dr. McBratney, who is my, I shared an office with, he said, oh, you, you got to go to the doctor's dining room and get the guys to know you and blah, blah, blah. Okay, okay, I'll go. Every morning I went, my coffee, it's 7 o'clock in the morning, the newspaper and the guys are all sitting around and nobody said anything to me for a month. Um, it was a couple months, a few months. And I was like, I was just going to give up. I was like, I'm not going down there anymore. They don't talk to me. And then finally somebody asked me a question, and I, I, I bumbled like an idiot because I couldn't think of it. I'm like, somebody's talking to me. But now, but now I'm, those guys, when they get together there, they wait for me to come. They're, 
excited. They're not happy if I can't make it. And so over time, it's kind of like, you know, the water in the rock. Eventually, you penetrate. And, and yeah, it's not easy sometimes to be sort of this quiet persistence or not so quiet persistence. Sometimes they don't have to be quiet. Um, but you have, to tell, you have to be able to tell the difference. Tell the difference to yourself. When is it important to be assertive, firm, and, you know, this don't mess with me kind of attitude. There's, there are absolutely times, as women especially, there are times that we have to. We have to just be, get in their face and say, no, this is not right. This is how it's going to be. This is what I demand. There are times when you absolutely, as a woman, have to do that. I don't care what, what profession, I don't care what line you're in, I don't care what you do. And I don't care who you're dealing with. If you're dealing with other women, if you're dealing with men, it doesn't matter. There are definitely times when if you want to move forward and you want to accomplish something, there are times that you just have to be, no, this is it. I'm not taking anything less than that. And then there are other times when you sort of do the, the like my, my friend calls me the uh, velvet harpoon, where you do the, you know, you, you do the nice. And you go, okay, mm -hmm, yeah. And you're taking notes in your head and, all right, I'll wait until the time's important and then I'll make an issue. So as a, so you have to, as a professional, as, as a student, I don't care what you're doing, it's all about choices. It's all about trying to decide and figure out which way you want to turn the situation. Because some situations you can't do anything about you're, it's, you're thrust in it and you're, you feel like you're going to drown. But you have to say, okay, this is not what I want. This is not how I want things to happen, but I want to be over there. And if I want to be over there, let me, let me do one step at a time and, and start seeing who can I use, who can I um, help, use to help me, or, or how can I help myself even. Sometimes that's an important, you have to help yourself. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing that I've learned in being a woman amongst, like I say, amongst men. And there are times that you just have to sort of let them know that they're, hey, I'm smarter than you. <laughs> I know more than you do. It's okay, you can act like you think you know more than I do, but it's okay. Because you don't have to be up in somebody's face all the time, and I think that that's um, I think that's bad behavior for any profession. And you know, unfortunately, when women do that, they get put in a category and a bad word, and you, people use all those nasty things. And and it's so much easier for people to do it for uh, with women than it is for men. Women to women, and men to women. And I th and so what's important is. I mean, you have to know yourself and you have to have the confidence in yourself that you're where you belong. Or if you're not where you belong, you're going to use whatever you have to use to get to where you belong. Because everyone belongs somewhere. And I, as a professional, you, you should have some kind of goal or some kind of idea of where you want to be. If you've already arrived, that's marvelous. Help somebody else who hasn't. So there's always something, some way that you can use your experiences and um, what you've learned. Um, so those are my thoughts. Uh, I have lots of other stories, but I don't want to go, you know, be too sp specific. But I don't know if anybody has any ideas or questions or thoughts or should I just keep talking? <laughs> At what point did you realize that I can do this? Let me take that next step, get out of my way. It's constant. There wasn't one particular point that, um, that I realized that. It, it's, it's a, it was a constant reassessment. I mean, rec a year and a half ago, I resigned from St. Luke's Hospital after working there for 23 years and because it wasn't what I wanted anymore. They weren't treating me with respect, the respect that I knew I should be getting and the system just wasn't, wasn't going well, and, and I was miserable. 
after 23 years, and I, and I tell people I was born in St. Luke's Hospital, I'm gonna die in St. Luke's Hospital. So to leave after 23 years was a big deal, but I realized that it's not working for me anymore. I need to find, go, I need to find something else. Now was it the system or was it the people? <coughs> the system. I think it was, well, it was people in the system who, who were functioning badly through the system. You know, functioning badly through the system. What do you mean by functioning badly? Like, were they not doing their capacity of their um, oh, position? Oh, so they. So it seemed to me that that a lot of the um, the policy or the the culture of the whole system had changed and didn't align with the way that I felt. You know, healthcare should be and me in particular and 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 they were putting things upon me and my other my partner we both left at the same time um, that like this shouldn't be anymore we've been here for 20 something years we've proven ourselves we take and and to be treated badly do you feel they did that because you had been there so long mm -mm. no it wasn't okay. personal it wasn't personal okay. no it wasn't it's like it was the godfather not personal it it wasn't against me personally. It had changed, and it wasn't working for me. I was miserable going to work. I felt like I was, you know, worse than being a slave labor. I felt like you know, and this is a, I'm a professional. I shouldn't feel like this is a burden to go to work every day. And so there have been many instances along my life where I've had to regroup and say, all right, what do I do now? You know, for instance, when, um, when I was, so I was in re residency, at surgical residency at Rhode Island Hospital. And um, I was trying to decide, do I want to do private practice? Or do I want to do what we call academic medicine, which is working in like a university hospital? Because I loved oncology surgery, cancer surgery. And I was trying to decide, is that what I wanted to do, be an oncology surgeon? And I realized after investigating that, to be an oncology surgeon, I'd have to do more training, like for a year or two, not that bad. Um, in a special in the specialty area but more so i would have to for the rest of my life or at least for the next 10 years be in an academic hospital like in a university hospital and i just didn't like you know the mentality university hospitals you know they they're they're worse they're as bad as universities in the sense where they're okay. You don't have to be a great surgeon, but you have to publish. You have to do all this research. You have to, you know, it's very competitive academically to be in an academic university center. And I didn't really like that. I liked taking care of people. I liked helping patients through their problems and taking care of them. So I decided that I was going to go into private practice. And at the time, um, I had two aunts who were nurses at St. Luke's, and they would been telling everybody, my daughter, my niece is a doctor, she wants to come back. So they started to court me, and um, in the process, they hired two other guys. Uh, and so the, the other doctors started to get a little nervous, saying, oh my God, you know, we can't really handle three new people in, in this community all at once. So they backed off on offering me a position. But by that time, I had decided that I really wanted to do that. And so I went. Somebody told me to talk to someone. And I decided, OK, I'm going to do this. And so I arranged to share an office with someone. And my mom was my secretary for the first like six months of my practice. And the first month, I didn't know, we didn't know anything. You know, We had somebody show us how to send off the bill. and. After six weeks, we typed them up on a typewriter, yeah, a typewriter. My mom typed them up and all the bills and put them in this manila envelope. And I, I'll never forget. I remember it was like in October. I started September 1st. I remember putting that envelope in the mailbox and literally saying a prayer, like, oh, I hope I get some money back. Because <laughs> I don't know if we did it right. 
Um, and so, you know, there have been multiple junctures where I've had to go, now what do I do? You know, I, I here I was thinking I'm going to be academic and then I'm going to be all set. And then the hospital says, no, we but I still want to come there. So you've it's a it's a constant regrouping, constant regrouping and and saying, all right, that's not working. But how can I make it work the way I want it to work? So you literally just kept plugging, kept plugging. I still do. I still do. So now I'm in a new practice in Taunton. And and uh, it's like starting over again starting over again. You know, you got to gain people's respect. People don't know who I am. I mean, we came and it's only through being yourself and, and doing what I know I do well that eventually it'll, they'll recognize who I am, And but it's starting over. People don't know who I am. Now, is it a, a specialty? I do general surgery. So general surgery, but I have a specialty interest in breast surgery. So general surgery is appendixes, gallbladders, intestines, uh, lumps and bumps, breast. Um, what else do we do? I left my little things here, yeah. So, um, you know, what I do, uh, so for breast, I do, and I'm building up the breast program there. They don't have one. So here I am, you know, building something up at this point in my life. But I like it, and it's important, and it's going to bring me business that I like. And it's, an, it's necessary. It's a necessary program. Every place needs a good breast program, you know, where you can bring people f through a good screening mammogram from diagnostics, getting them done quickly into their surgery, and getting them aligned with, their, with whatever oncologist that they need. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm doing that there and working with different radiation oncologists, trying to get a collaborative so that patients can seamlessly go from one thing to the next. Um, I, I want, I did a lot of plastic surgery with a plastic surgeon in New Bedford. Um, I don't do plastic surgery, but, um, but I want to. So I'm trying to figure out who I can get to mentor me to do some plastic surgery down in so Newton. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. Do you, um, do Not really. We don't do that. No. So you just do uh, no, I do benign do benign breast problems as well. Yeah, but I don't do reconstructive. I don't do any kind of reconstruction do you do at this point. Reconstruction. Oh, reconstruction. So it's already been a reduction. Yeah. So anything. So the bad, the butcher right. That would be reconstruction. It'd still be reconstruction. So you don't do that. Not now. I took a course. A, I that, took a course because I now, took a course a year with. ago. No, I took a course a year ago, and um, on how to do re breast re breast reductions and things like that. But I need a ment I need to find a plastic surgeon who's willing to take me through the first couple of cases. So a, I'm working on it. That's something I've been thinking about all the way through. This. Did you have mentors that helped you at these junctures? And because I think there's a paucity of that. Uh, mm that women don't mentor each other. That's true. So I'm wondering what your experience with that is, and if there are, if you were, <coughs> you know, we, we were both working with the YWC right. for many years. Mm -hmm. and, um, that's always something that we've been talking about, empowering women, and mentoring yeah. is an important thing. It's, it's critically important because um, it's hard. It's hard to, it's hard to find mentors sometimes, and sometimes you kind of just stumble on them, and they're a godsend. I mean, a lot of my mentors, I see them as godsends, you know, where God put somebody in, put me in a situation, not always a good situation, that I needed help from this person, and they turned out to be this wonderful mentor. You know, that Dr. McBratney is a perfect example of someone where it, I, we met on not the best of, or I was in a little bit of an issue, and, but he became the best mentor, one of the best mentors I've ever had. But there have been other people along the way, and and but as I was you know, like in high school, no, there wasn't anybody, and even in early college years, I don't think so. It was only later that I can think of specific people. But um, and you know, if some of it is the generation that I'm at, 
you know, my parents didn't go to college, so a lot of the people my age are first generation college students. And so you don't have mentors who can say, oh, this is how you do it and this is what you have to do. And um, now maybe, I think now it's a little different because the younger people growing up do have other people around them who've gone through the processes. Um, but it is important. It's important for men and women to have someone who can, who can give them a little bit of wisdom and point them in the right direction. I mean, there's lots of ways to do that. Um, some of it, you, if you, you know, if you think that you're interested in a certain field, if you start hanging around or finding people who are in that field, just listening to them talk and watching, following them around every day for a couple of days will give you some information and help you to kind of, and you can pick their brains. But you do have to be, you do have to be active about it. You can't be passive and you can't wait for people to say, oh, I want to be your mentor. Guys, it doesn't really happen that way. Unless they have a women's center that will hook up people together. But, but in general, I think that people don't necessarily recognize the importance of having um, someone who, you can, who, who knows a little bit more. It can be, so a younger person can bounce ideas off and, and get some direction. So, Is this something that men actually, do they have a lot of support groups? mentors and so now the women are just trying to build their strength well men are not men are not gatherers like women are gatherers they don't yeah they're, they're kind of little lone soldiers most of them um, and okay, men are you funny need mentors through like whether you're a male or you female. do but I don't think that there's that so men so personality wise men are are they, they gather together for a reason, you know, like they, they'll gather together because they all like basketball or they want to play a game together or something like that. Women gather together because they like each other. So it's very different how men gather versus women gather. And so because men tend to gather around a purpose, the people in that group end up having the same purpose. Mm -hmm. And so they serve as each other's mentors. Whereas women tend to gather because they like each other or their girlfriend told them to come and have drinks, whatever, as opposed to professional, you know, hanging around because you're all in the same profession. Um, and so, so it is different. And, and I think women have to figure out how to kind of model that idea of purposeful gathering, you know. So men really have a purposeful gathering. So they have a, always have a purpose. They don't just hang around with each other because they like to chat. It's a, there's a reason. There's always a reason. Whereas women, eh, they may just kind of hang around. But I think women, that's one way that a woman needs to sort of start thinking like a man in terms of if you're, if you're going to be with a group of women, what are we accomplishing from it. Not that you're using people, but that you're trying to get in a, in a, in a uniform mind pattern. Mm. And I don't think women do that often enough, or they don't see the importance of that. I think they don't also follow up. It's a whole networking thing, and I don't think women follow up on that or pursue it. They don't have the drive. And I think it's once you get the confidence, like you said, in yourself, and, and you start saying, well, I don't care what people say, negativity, just shed that mm -hmm. negativity and, and drive forward. I mm -hmm. think that's when you get purpose. Yeah, and you can go that's forward. true. And that's when you want network. And it actually is meaningful and, and comes together. Yeah. You can make a difference. That's right. Women tend to get caught up on things that are peripheral. You know, that's like right. they well, tend people, to get caught up on the, on the side things that. as opposed to a purpose. And I, and I think that that's one, you know, men are funny people, but that's one thing that I think we could, we could do a lot better for ourselves if we took some, some of that concept and, and really start to understand it and, and say, oh, I see. Why do you think men play golf? 
I mean, they play golf, yeah, because they like to hit a ball, but they're they're networking with each other, and and they just they and it's not like they said, oh, I like you guys, let's go. They always have to have a reason, so their reason is to get together as they're playing golf, but they're also sharing and they're you know telling, oh. Oh, we're having this issue. I'm going to hook you up with so and so and so and so, and it's under the guise of golf, but they're accomplishing something at the same time. I think there's generational too. I think there's some of that that's the. Uh, I think uh, men have been in power for a long time. And they didn't find the scarcity of resources because it was accessible to them. Mm -hmm. And women had a scarcity of of of, of accessible resources. True. So there's always a little bit of a competition, I think, in, in, those, in, in our time. Yeah. And I'm wondering, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm going to ask you about, um, are there more women uh, in medicine now than there have you? Have you seen an, in, an increase? So. Are, are you finding a difference in the culture of uh, the, the younger people coming in? Yeah. Young women, I guess women is really mm. what I'm so the statistics say that uh, most medical schools are close to 50-50 now. That's really good. Yeah, most medical schools are close to 50-50. And 30 years, 40 years ago, what, 40, 50, 50 maybe, there were some schools that were still all male. Most, I think most of them, probably 50 years ago. All male. So, um, you know, the presence of women does um, foster change. It does foster cultural change because when women are around, they people start to think of them as an entity that needs to be considered. Um, it and and that's like any any other organ, any other entity, whether it's people of color or people of different languages or religions. If they're not around, if they're not included at the table. Nobody thinks about them, and and they, they're they're out of sight, out of mind, and so it's so I think having women around has definitely changed the way people think because now you realize oh, yeah maybe I shouldn't tell that joke because that's a sexist joke or and because there's a woman sitting over here, but if you're not around then they don't think about it they don't they don't check themselves. And so, um, so it forces cultural change. The presence and the existence of, of, of inclusivity forces change. So how about some of the negative repercussions of women coming into the field? We call it often the pinking of a profession. I don't know if you've ever heard that term, but it's often used when, uh, when we have a surgence of women into traditionally uh, male-held roles, mm -hmm. and as a result, the people say that the um, salaries have gone down. Some could argue that it's just the change in health care and, you know, the hospitalist movement and everything else, and, mm -hmm. um, but there are some people who equate that, uh, the pinking of medicine with um, um, salary decreases as well, and I don't know. You're in that world. I'm not. Yeah. I don't know if you have an opinion on that or, or observations, but I'd love to hear that as well because that's mm. that's often one of the challenges that we face as women when we we move into fields. We're we're still not, of course, paid at the Correct. same level as that's right. our male counterparts. I don't know. Yeah, I, it's a, that's a great that's a great thought question. Yeah. So a male with your education. Gets paid more. Could still. be, could yeah, some places. Where are they? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I th and so one of the things that has happened in medicine, and it may be because of the involvement of women, is, uh, and this happened after I finished residency, where these restrictions on work hours were placed. Uh, so before, like when I was when I was resident, <laughs> um, you could work you could work almost forty eight hours straight, and and nobody and that was normal. 
you just didn't leave until the work was done. And there were some of our call schedule was 24 on, 24 off, which means you cut in the hospital at like 5.30 in the morning and you didn't leave until the next day, like 11 o'clock, because you had to wait, get all your work done and da 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 da. So you were there for more than 24 hours, 36 hours. Sometimes if, you, if things went on, you were there for longer. Not long after I finished residency, there were now these real restrictions on work hours. And, um, and very strictly, I mean, institutions could lose their credit, accreditation if they violated this. And I, I, I wonder if that had something to do with the infusion of women, because women were like, what are you do? You know, guys are just like, yeah, just keep going, just keep going, oh, fight, 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 fight. And women were like, yeah, um, it's time to go because my brain isn't thinking anymore and I can't make any decisions. And so that's probably, I bet that that's one thing that aligned with the number of women coming in. Um, <clears throat> and so healthcare is a weird, is a weird industry because there are, there have been so many other intrusions into it that um, I don't think you can just blame one thing you know healthcare has become a business um and i don't think that had anything to do with women okay <laughs> and so some of the changes in healthcare is because business people are running healthcare I institutions and they they think that it's it's a it's a business they just happen to be taking care of people you know and and we're like it's a hospital we got sick people oh, yeah but you know you got to get them in get them out like, no, it's not a shoe factory. This, these are people's lives. And business people th who've, who've sort of taken over healthcare don't think that way. And it's been, I think that's causing the main detriment of healthcare. I think brain research has really started to take off now. We know a lot more about how people learn how the brain works and how sleep deprivation leads to True. Uh, illness. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, it's, I think it's a, a lot, it's a, you know, confluence. Sure, a multifactorial, yeah, they're Which definitely. You know, we can't be static, it, ha it has to be that. Right, different. yeah. So you also work at a hospital where there is a woman's CEO? There is, yes. How does that, uh, how does that feel? To this? Is it the first time that you've worked under a woman's CEO? A CEO, yes. And so uh, do, are you seeing some differences? And, mm -hmm. and, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that, I, the yeah. style difference. Absolutely. It's completely patients. different, you know, and, and uh, South, I was at South Coast before and that was absolutely male heavy. I mean, they had one major woman executive and they relinquished her position as, as the years went on. So when I left, there were no women in, pile, in posi high positions at South Coast. And so to have a woman CEO and they had a woman chief nurse officer and majority of the managers actually are women and in Morton where I am now. It is different. It is different because um, you, I feel they're more, much more approachable. Like, and and uh, I did this the other day, not just my own, you know, my own <laughs> way of being. This woman who, I think she's a, nurse, chief nurse officer, some, I forget, she's like second in command. We'd had a meeting a couple of weeks ago to talk about this breast program and I ran into her in the hallway and I was like, oh, I've been looking for you. I want to make sure you did your homework after our meeting. And the president of the hospital was standing right next to me, right now, and she heard this whole exchange and she was like, wow, you're not even afraid to talk to an administrator that way. I'm like, no, why would I be? Because <laughs> We're all part of the same team, and um, and and it was welcomed. Though it wasn't, it wasn't like she felt like I was um, bashing her or anything. You know, she really was like, "Yeah, no, it's okay," and and it was a positive. It was actually taken on in a positive way. It was really kind of funny because I, it didn't even occur, it it didn't occur to me that I was talking to the second in command person. I mean, we just had a meeting together and we we're both trying to accomplish this important goal. To me, the goal is more important than 
who's who's where and and I think um, that that might be a, a way that women are different that the goal is important it's not necessarily a position you know I, I, I don't care what position I have and I don't care who has what position if you did something wrong I'm gonna t call you out if you did something great I'm gonna tell you too but um, so it is a, it is a different environment there yeah so we try. What was your hardest struggle? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, Sorry, I, I keep so <laughs> the, the one of the one of the hardest things I had was, um, you know, we have to take all of these standardized tests constantly. I just took one the other, you know, to recertify myself. Um, and I didn't pass my boards the first time I took them. And that was devastating. It was absolutely devastating because um, I know I knew everything. I know I knew stuff. I, you know, I studied, and, but I didn't pass. And it put me back. It put me back like, you know, months because now you have to, you can't move on to the next, the next pro, um, level that you're supposed to. And so it was hard. It was, it was hard because, Did you feel like huh? Did you feel like quitting? Yeah, of course. And, but worse, it was, but the worst thing isn't that I wanted to quit. The worst was that I was afraid, afraid to go again, like to take them again. That's worse than the fear of quitting, to be honest, I think. The fear of, of failing again is worse than the fear of quitting because quitting you can find something else to do but failing again it, the that fear was was horrible um and you you know you have to work through it i still am traumatized by it <laughs> clearly <laughs> i'm still traumatized by it but but that was probably that was probably the most difficult Part, I think yeah because you, because you constantly um, question yourself and once you start doing that then you know you're kind of in trouble a little bit of trouble but that was probably the worst probably the worst thing I mean everything else is trans that didn't seem so transient <laughs> yeah yeah if there was one thing that you could change for what you did, what would that be? Hmm. Um, I think um, I think I wouldn't have been as sh a shy person for as long as I was shy, because now I realize that you can get so much more done by not being afraid to talk to people and um, so. But that was, I mean, I guess that was my personality at the time. I mean, but. Because I, I look at my daughter, who is 18, and she's a freshman in college, and she, her years in high school, now I used to yeah, fuss, 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 because she thought that having a good time at school was just as important as doing well, and I didn't think that. But she had a good time in high school, and, I, and now I'm like, I can't go back and be a 20-year-old and do those things I should have done at 20, but I was too afraid to, or whatever. Um, but you, you know, you can only live one life. So here's an interesting little, an interesting experience. I w so when my daughter was, I think she was in second grade. There were these moms. There were four of us, four four all together. That we our girls were close together, and so we all said, "Well, let's go have coffee." So we went over one's house on a Saturday, and um, one's Oh, one married young, and she works somewhere, and she had two kids and home and all that stuff. Another one went off to college and then got married, and she works for her husband. And then another one, um, I forget what the third one, she might have been a pure homemaker. And then there's me. So we're sitting over a coffee. Every one of us said we wish we had the other one's life. Like, Every one of us, none of us were satisfied. 
you know, we all sort of said, oh, I wish I had had kids younger, not waited until I was, you know, older. Wish I had gotten married later. I wish I. So as that's another thing I think as women we're always criticizing ourselves, but but there's always a different road. I mean, you can only go on one road, and that's the thing that after listening to you know having this conversation with these women, I you know I thought, well, you can only do one road at a time. You can't you can't straddle. You take a pick and you go with that, and hopefully it's the right one. Um, and I think everybody, all of our, our, the women were happy. We were all happy, but yet you're always thinking, well, what if? What if I had done such and such instead of such and such? What if I had chosen this instead of that? Um, I mean, you, who knows, you know, but you can only do one thing. You can only go down one road at a time. So the answer to that question was, change anything it would be to not be shy as you were mm -hmm. yeah. that's pretty good in a woman in your yeah because I look at my daughter who's this vibrant person she's got you know friends are over all the time she went to every football game she went to every hockey game I never did any of that in high school and she made friends with all these kids and um I had my little handful of friends that I was close to and that was it and yeah I think I missed out on I missed out on a, a something. Yeah, it is too late. I can't go back and you can't go back <laughs> I can't go back and be do what I like a twenty year old would do. <laughs> I did it vicariously through my kids. Yeah, exactly. So and and I admire her but now, granted, my grades were much better than hers were in high school, so you do sacrifice something. I was a much better student. She's smart, but on paper, I, I was a much better student than she is. So you can't have everything. You can't have it all. You can't have it all. And that, I remember, you know, when we were, when I was in college, that was the thing. Oh, you can have it all. You can have it all. This was, it was a, in fact, somebody probably wrote books about it. It's not true. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. Yeah, it's not true. I mean, you can have it all, but it's not going to be all at 100%. You know, you can have it all. But you're gonna have to be you're gonna have to be thirty percent in this some one time, seventy percent over here, and maybe it'll switch, but you can't be a hundred percent in everything all the time. It just it's not possible. Well, you were you were quite one hundred percent focused, and you know everybody has their purpose in life. Yeah. And you wouldn't. Do you feel you would? who you are and where you are had you been 30 percent football no no so and that's what I'm saying you can't you can't have it all but and you can only live one road you can only go down one road once you sit because because for me it was more important to be an a excellent student to go to a, the best school I could possibly put my name into to me that was more important than going to the dances and Because it's different. It's a different way of living. My daughter's life's totally different from mine. The shyness just doesn't impact your social life. It impacts what you said before. Uh, it impacts your professional development because yeah. Yeah. Um, you're sort of isolated. You're not able to um, yeah. interact with people who can, you know, clue you in. But I can say, Trisha, that you're no longer shy. I'm not <laughs> shy anymore. That's true. <laughs> you're traveling now. And you're yeah, I'm not shy life. anymore. There is uh, there's a little problems. bit in there. There still is a little bit. But when I know I have a purpose, I'm not shy. You know, if, if I don't have a purpose, then like a cocktail party, I, I, I don't like cocktail parties too much because you have to go talk to the, you know, think Small about something that, yeah. <laughs> As the Patriots. But yeah. But in your wisdom now, you're choosing how you move through the world. Yes, right. Yes, true, true, true. Yeah. Do you have any women um, advisors going through school? Mm. No. No. Do you think that had any impact on you? I mean, other than being at Wellesley, I mean, that's all women. Yeah. I mean, I think that that was the largest impact. If I, I don't, I would not be the person I am if I hadn't gone to Wellesley. That I know. Jackie, um, anywhere in Massachusetts? I don't think so, no. Mm. Um, 
but um, Hillary Clinton went there. No. And the evidence is very strong for women to go to all of the schools, especially the same as you have that are that have been kind of labeled as more traditional for men. Mm -hmm. And that is a really wonderful part about our all women institutions. True. Right. There's a sisterhood, and um, you don't have to compete with the men in your class. That's right. You don't. And that's a really wonderful message for women as they mm. consider all women school. I think sometimes socially they think, well, I don't want to go to a school. Mm -hmm. Right. But in reality, it, it is very formative, formative in, yeah. in one's development, uh, in crystallizing a path. It that, is. That where, you, where you have the confidence. It's true. Yeah. And I had a conversation with one of the teachers at my daughter's high school, and she said she sometimes could see a transition of a young woman who, was, who had the potential to be here, but she kind of let herself go down a little bit because she wanted to be cute and she wants to you know attract the guy and da, da, da. and so you don't want to be the smartest girl in the room with all the guys around so women still think that way and um they do they some some girls still think that way that oh if i'm too smart he's not gonna like me or whatever do you think that's in their upbringing or just in society both i think it's in both Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Let's go, go ahead, already. Yes. I, I'm curious, Beach, and I'm thinking of a book I just recently read, Becoming, um, uh, Michelle Obama's book, and she's, you know, we're always in your stories that you, you went from high school, and there's always a new challenge mm -hmm. as you went through life, and you were persistent. So now that you're in this stage, what do you think you're becoming or evolving to, or what is it that you want your legacy to be? Like, at this point, you've oh. already accomplished yeah. a certain, what, what is your yeah. next seat, or what do you want? Um, I'm at an interesting position in my life right now where um, I'm not sure. This is the one time in my life where I don't have a goal. I don't have um, something that I, I, I need to personally accomplish. Because lucky for, you know, lucky for me, I mean, my daughter is, she's tucked in in college, which is probably the biggest accomplishment. Um, you know, I feel in my profession, I've done everything that I've wanted to do, and, and, and I've, I've proven everything that I wanted to prove in terms of that I could be a successful surgeon, a good business person, and all that. And I know that I can still continue to do that. And so I am in an interesting spot in my life where I, and, and I had a hard time with it. Like months, a few months ago, I was talking to this friend of mine, and I'm like, I've never been in a place where I didn't have, okay, next. I didn't have, okay, next. Um, so, but I'm excited about it because I know that there is a next. I know there is a next. And exactly what that's going to look like, I don't know. Um, I'm happy in medicine, but I could, I could leave medicine and I'd be totally satisfied. To <laughs> sit accomplished, feeling accomplished, even though I still like what I do. So, so it's an inter I'm in an interesting point, yeah. So that was just an accomplishment. That wasn't something like you pick for, like, let's say it was a hobby. No, that, it's definitely not a hobby, but do you know what I mean by that? Like, it was my life goal. Right. My life goal was to be a doctor and so to... Well, I didn't know that there would, at the time, I mean, uh, but, but when I knew that I wanted to be a surgeon, then it became that I wanted to be an accomplished, a good surgeon who can tell when a patient needs surgery and when they don't, mm -hmm. and a kind surgeon that treats people with respect. And, um, <laughs> and um, I, I feel I've, I've, I've accomplished that. So interesting you say that, and we can talk some more about this. Um, I, the hospital that wants to do this uh, focus on like ex patient experience, and so I think I'm, so I told the CMO, Chief Medical Officer, that I want to develop this program using student volunteers to um, figure out how can we make the hospital's uh, experience better. So maybe that's my next.
But no, but so um, we should talk <coughs> about how we can do that. Um, using students to try and enhance the patient experience in the hospital. Because everyone is so strapped out now. The nurses are strapped to the computers and patients don't feel like they're not getting that compassionate care that, and, and they, nurses want to do it and they're trying, but, but I think that there's a way to use students and volunteers. So I'm trying to f figure that one out. Hmm. That might be, that's my next, yeah, one of my next. The nurses one? That the nurses? Oh, I was against it, yeah. And can I ask why? Because um, it took, to me, it took a major decision making out of the hands of the people who knew how to make those decisions. You know. I worked the campaign. That's why I was like, wow, the doctor. I yeah. Was, my big thing was you don't want the government to take over anymore to, to control. Right. There's enough, and there's enough um, decision making that's taken out of everybody's hands. But you know, if you if you you know if you got six people on the floor on on the <coughs> floor, and you have three nurses, and you got one person who's you know at the tail end of their hospital course, they're not going to need a lot of care. But you got somebody who's who's sick as a dog and needs uh, you know medicines every hour. Somebody needs to be able to make a decision to say, I'm going to put one nurse on with that and let the other one take three patients. But right. the um, decision was not going to allow that to happen, that question. So I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy I asked you because I was like, look, I, I worked that campaign. Uh -huh. And I was on for no also. Sure, OK. And so I was curious how, how the doctor, a lot of the nurses, the millennial nurses, Wanted, yes. Of course, yeah. More. Yes, I agree they need more. Of course, but that's right. That's not the way to get what you want. No. Yeah. But it did open the doctor's eyes, I think. I think so. Yeah. All right, well, time. thank you thank for having you. me. This was great. It was nice to see you girls. Yeah.